Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Enabling Optimal Group Management with a Federated Identity Service. My name is Emily Cashel. I'm with Radiant Logic, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, if you have a question, you may enter it in the Go to Webinar window, and we will have a Q&A session at the end if time allows. If we are not able to get to your question during the webcast, we'll send a personal email to follow up. Also, this webcast will be recorded and sent out along with a copy of the presentation slides within the next 24 hours. Our speaker today will be Lisa Grady, Senior Solutions Architect with Radiant Logic. Lisa has been with us for over 17 years in a variety of technical roles and is currently managing our product management team. She is an expert in identity integration and directory virtualization and has been helping Radiant Logic's customers solve some of their toughest identity and group integration challenges for many years. Lisa, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Emily. So let's get started. So the focus of today's webinar is on optimizing groups management. Um, if your organization is like most of the Fortune 1000, you deal with about 20% turnover as people are hired and fired, uh, promoted, assigned new projects. And some statistics have shown that 85% of these companies are manually maintaining groups affected by these turnover rates. Because you need to. Applications are relying on these groups to make sure policies are enforced, giving people right access to the right resources. So keeping these groups up to date might be painful, but they're absolutely essential. During today's webinar, I'll describe how you can make your groups much more flexible. You can evolve into a more attribute-based access control model without having to start over from scratch. And I'll start with a, a brief overview of the need for identity integration to support um, identification and authentication for web access management and federation, and then get into the various challenges that crop up around groups management for these users. Challenges with implementing or evolving your IIM architectures are caused by a world of expanding access. So on one side, you have the user populations. They're expanding from employees to contractors, vendors, partners, customers. On the application side, you're no longer looking at just applications on premise inside the corporate domain, but partner applications, cloud applications. And on the device side, you have to deal with not only enterprise computers, but more and more personal devices. So all of these different vectors are expanding. At the highest level, the challenges start because on one side of the architecture you have applications and they are providing the services and need to be able to authenticate and authorize users for these services. On the other side, you have your internal user and group populations in a variety of different data silos. So in order to service these many different user populations, an application would have to be able to first connect to all these various different systems. Oftentimes, applications can't even connect to multiple data sources to be able to identify and authenticate the user without some kind of heavy customizations. Uh, even if they could, the number of connections that you would need to manage every time you brought on a new application or if you need to add a new data source would grow exponentially. The application would have to understand how to identify a user, what attribute do they need to look for, um, how to authenticate the user, it might be with a credential or a PIV card or a Kerberos. Um, how to retrieve the profile attributes or group membership. These are going to be required typically for enforcing authorization. Um, and lastly, how do they adjust in the future as your data silos start to evolve? You've got mergers and acquisitions, migration and consolidation efforts. So this kind of system clearly doesn't scale well. Some applications we've seen um, have tried to add flexibility in terms of supporting multiple data sources, um, maybe some simplified identity mapping to be able to link overlapping user accounts, but generally this just results in more customization, more configuration that you have to maintain now at each of your applications. And if you set this up 
at the level of your application, this logic can't be shared by other applications. So then you have to redo this customization and work every single time. Federation has uh, been an approach to solve the challenges around this application expansion that I'm talking about. And when you look at the architecture for claims enabled applications, so they, these are known as your service providers or your relying parties, they rely on and redirect the authentication request to an identity provider, so the IDP. With this approach, the credentials, they don't have to cross the firewall. Um, you, don't, you have less complex synchronization flows to manage. So if a user changes their on-premise password, uh, you don't have to deal with things like password management at the application level, reset policies, things like that. Also, the users are authenticated in the local authoritative sources on-premise. So this allows the, the sources to maintain control over those credentials. So at a high level then, it's the identity provider that's responsible for connecting to the different data sources, handling the different data formats and how to authenticate the user. And then the identity provider packages up this information, so the assert assertions about the user, um, into a token. And then it redirects the user back to the application, which will now grant them access based on the token contents. So when you start to look at solutions like this, it's important to understand that there are really two layers involved here. Uh, one is the federated access layer. So the part that uh, provides the token creation and translation and enforces the single sign-on. The other part that's needed is the federated identity layer. So the minute you start to have multiple heterogeneous data sources, you're gonna start to see some challenges. And in cases like this, the identity provider's job just got a lot more complex. So what happens if the data sources aren't exclusive anymore and a user has an account in more than one of them? So now the IDP must not only be able to handle the different access me mechanisms, understand the different metadata, how to request authentication, but now they have to figure out and address situations where a search for a user can return more than one user. Is it the same person? If not, which one is the identity you need to authenticate, etc. So a better approach to something like this is to divide the work and think about it as two different layers. You need one global reference list to identify and authenticate users. You need one single access point to retrieve a complete profile of information about that user. This means all their profile attributes, including what groups they're a member of. And you need to get this information. You don't want to have to build it from scratch. The information already exists in many data silos. So trying to populate an entirely new data store with this information would just be a huge effort. So the integration of these identities, that's the role of the Federated Identity Service. When you look at most large enterprises, the reality is that they have multiple identity sources and different security means for authenticating the users in each of these systems. Um, each source also is going to maintain its own set of attributes and groups for users. There was a, an Osterman research study about eh, a couple years ago that showed large enterprises on average have 41 data sources for internal users, 71 for partners and suppliers, and 62 for customer information. And that user attributes are managed in about 13 different data sources. So this is a reality. Um, some of these sources are used for authentication, while others contain additional profile information about the users. So regardless, the first step is to build that integrated list of identities. And then this list becomes the basis for being able to join the common identities and build the global profile by pulling attributes from these multiple data sources. Once you have this unique list and the profile attributes available to you, then you can start to categorize and group your users according to the policies that you want to enforce. Generally, users are authorized based either on their profile containing a specific attribute or more often what groups they're a member of. 
So some of the challenges for attribute-based authorization are, well, for starters, like I've talked about, um, having same user accounts in different data silos, resulting in profile information being distributed across these silos as well. Sometimes the attributes aren't even stored in the format expected by an application. So you may have to do some translations or computations on the information to get it in the format the application expects. Um, and sometimes applications need a place to store certain attributes. So maybe uh, related to session information, last login or password policy. Existing data source owners oftentimes are not too excited about having to extend existing schemas to accommodate new application requirements. So that's something we have to take into consideration as well. Although attribute-based access control, ABAC, it's, um, it's a trend toward externalizing authorization and it's starting to come up more and more in discussions. Um, groups, though, are still primarily going to be used for authorization. So some of the challenges specifically related to groups can stem from the fact that identities are spread across multiple data sources. So when you start to aggregate and, and integrate the identities, you must take into account how the group memberships are maintained in these various data sources also. For directories, for example, the relationship between groups and members is based on the hierarchy. So members can be statically defined in the group entries or computed by the server itself to be returned in a member of attribute in the user entry. So imagine a scenario where I have multiple directories that are being aggregated into a common namespace and I use a new hierarchy. Now you have a requirement to translate the user and the group DNs and all the references to those into the new naming that's used in the new hierarchy. Oftentimes um, when deploying new applications, existing groups aren't sufficient either. So you need to be able to define some new groups that contain members from different data sources. So how does a federated identity service help address the challenges around authorization? First, identities must be aggregated and integrated into a unique list. And we refer to this as the identity hub. So if a user has multiple, uh, an account and multiple data sources, reference links to those accounts are maintained in the hub as well. And then these links are used to build a complete profile for all identities. Each individual local source still maintains the identity attributes it's responsible for, but the identity hub reflects these attributes as part of the global profile, which makes this information available for grouping users into different contexts. When basing authorization on a group membership, Radiant One can be used to rationalize and aggregate existing groups from the different data silos. Um, it can be used to flatten nested groups if needed, compute dynamic groups with members across multiple sources, and it even allows you to compute a member of value and associate this with the user's profile. I'll be showing uh, you some examples of these different capabilities in just a bit. And lastly, instead of applications having to be customized to deal with the particular nuances of how each data source stores and manages groups, they can rely on an integration layer that can deliver the view of groups they need. So as I mentioned, authorization is still very much based on groups, so role-based, uh, which is why the, the groups-based box here is highlighted in this slide. It's the primary focus of the webinar. All right. Over the next few slides, um, I'm going to take you through a variety of different scenarios that our customers are facing when it comes to dealing with groups, just to share some of their experiences. Um, they involve remapping existing group membership, uh, correlating same user accounts to then be able to get a, a global view of all groups a user is a member of, handling LDAP dynamic groups um, and nested groups and being able to generate new groups comprised of um, members from a variety of different heterogeneous data sources. So the first illustration here depicts a very common use case. Um, Radiant One provides a single global reference image for identities and groups. 
So now instead of having to search across three sources for groups and members, an application only needs to search against Radiant 1 to check group membership. For applications expecting LDAP groups, the membership value is a set of distinguished names indicating the user entries that are members of the group. However, you just can't take the existing values of the user DNs as they are because they don't match the new aggregated namespace anymore. With Radiant 1, those member DNs are going to be automatically remapped to match the new namespace, allowing the applications to then be able to identify the user and then properly identify the user's associated groups because the value in the group entry matches the naming that's used in the virtual namespace. So for example, we have in the Active Directory US domain, there is a user John who's a member of marketing. And in that particular domain, his DN points, the member of the marketing group points to his reference in that local directory hierarchy. But when you aggregate multiple different sources and you mount them in to create a new hierarchy, which is what is shown in this diagram, now, John's location and the directory structure, his distinguished name, is slightly different. So we have to make sure that the group memberships that are reflected in the Federated Identity Service also are changed and updated to match the naming of the new namespace. So if you have existing groups that are sufficient for enforcing your policies, you don't have to redo any work when deploying Radiant 1. You can take these existing groups and they can be, they can be virtualized um, and the DN, re DN remapping happens automatically. Um, now in the example that's shown here, the uh, new hierarchy in the Federated Identity Service, you can see that it keeps pretty much the same structure as the backend directory. Um, and in this case, it just has maybe one or two parent, new parent levels. So the remapping effort is um, automatic in, our, in this case. In some situations where you may have, let's say, uh, flattened the list of users, so instead of having them segregated across the uh, three different containers, the OU81, OU82, and OU Sun, you could have a scenario where you want all the users across all the different backends mounted below one container. In situations like that, the remapping uh, gets a little more complex, but we do have some um, computation, some functions, some computed attributes to help you in more complex scenarios. So the one that's shown here is a pretty straightforward remapping scenario. If it does get more complex, if you change your hierarchy, if you flatten and, and combine all the users from the backends under one container, uh, the remapping gets a little more tricky, but we do have utilities to help you with those scenarios as well. This next example narrows the focus specifically to Active Directory domains. So you have Active Directory A and B in this example. Um, when you look at one Active Directory forest with many domains, which are often set up by geographic location, there shouldn't be duplicate user accounts. This was the original thinking, but in reality, large businesses haven't always applied this rule. Existing business processes may dictate that you get an account provisioned when you physically go to a specific office if you need to access resources protected in that security domain. These processes that are in place don't always enforce the best practices, and you can find situations where duplicate accounts are created locally in each domain. In this example, Andrew Fuller has ended up having an account um, in, across the two different Active Directory domains. And within each domain, he's a member of groups reflective of what he needs to be authorized to do. So the first challenge, as I've been, as I've been mentioning um, throughout this entire presentation, is first identifying that Andrew in domain A is in fact the same person as Andrew in domain B. After you can correlate these common accounts, then you can retrieve a list of all the groups across these domains that Andrew is a member of. And then you can decide at that point which groups are relevant for you to enforce authorization. But at least you have a global view now of all Andrew's groups. So at the top here in the federated identity layer, you have the correlated identity view on the right. And then on the left, there's the existing groups view. So showing that he is both a member of the all users group and a member of the sales group.
In this next example, um, the group membership is being dynamically computed based on attributes of the user profile. So Andrew Fuller in this scenario has three accounts in these different three different systems and a single common identifier doesn't exist at this point. However, with the metadata information from each of the, the backend data sources, you have a list of identity attributes that you can use to define some correlation rules with something, let's say, involving um, department number and SAM account name in Active Directory, uh, the department number with given name and SN from the LDAP directory, and the department ID and end user ID from the database. So based on some simple computations and rules, Andrew's three accounts can be linked, and then the global profile can be built. So the global profile in this case is being reflected in the, the correlated identity view. Then once you have this global profile, it can now become the basis for creating a dynamic group view. So in this particular example, any identity that has clearance level of one, a title equal VP of sales and region of PA is going to be a member of a group named PA sales. So this kind of functionality gives you flexibility to evolve now from a, a narrow single criterion for group assignment to one that's more attribute based, more data driven. Now, if you take it one step further, by defining a simple computed attribute, the user entry can include a member of attribute containing the group information that the user is a member of. So with this example, excuse me, authorization on group membership can be done by either looking for the user as a member in the group entry or by looking in the user entry for a member of attribute. So either one of those two types of functionalities can be accommodated by these two virtual views. The example in this slide describes um, the ability to auto-generate both the group names and the members based on attributes of user profiles. So on the previous slide, I described how you can um, define a group name, PA sales, and then you can define the criteria that qualifies people to be a member of that particular group. In this scenario shown here, the group name itself can also be auto-generated. So in this particular example, the group names are populated based on all the possible values of departments. So here you can see virtual groups that have names, uh, sales, HR, and marketing, and these are auto-generated. The group members then are dispatched into the relevant group based on the value of their department attribute. This functionality also alleviates the manual group management task because if a user changes departments, for example, they are automatically assigned to a different group accordingly. Again, helping alleviate some of that manual task of moving users from groups as they change departments or roles or get hired or fired or whatever a case may be. This example um, describes classic LDAP dynamic groups and dynamic groups came along to remove some of the burden that I've been talking about on administrators to manage groups. So instead of manually assigning members statically to a group, the administrator would essentially define an LDAP query that would qualify the group members. So in this example shown on this slide, all the users located below OU users with the department having a value of HR are going to be members of that HR group. The problem with this approach in this classic LDAP dynamic group approach is that not all applications can support dynamic groups because it requires them to issue an additional query based on the value that gets returned in that member of attribute or that member URL attribute to get the list of members. So instead of just being able to search for the group entry and get the members, they have to actually issue two searches, one to get the group they get the member URL, and then issue the additional search to get the members. And not all applications are equipped to handle this. So with Radiant 1 in the picture, 
You can automatically evaluate the dynamic groups and return them as static groups with the members included in the group entry. So this uh, removes the requirement of that extra search on the applications. So in this example, the client can request the HR group and get back the group entry, which includes the member of Sally Smith, which was evaluated um, by Radium One. Because of the inflexibility of categorizing users based on that single static criteria of group name, Another way that some administrators have tried to alleviate that burden is to use nested groups. And we see that with Active Directory a lot with a lot of our customers. Um, and it is a way for them to segment the users further. So using nesting, you can add a group as a member of another group to allow inheritance of permissions from one group to its subgroups. As an example shown here, the intern group is a member of the PR group. So just as not all applications can work with LDAP dynamic groups, not all applications can deal with nested groups. With Radiant One, you can flatten the nested groups to deliver the group information to the application. So again, similar to the, oops, similar to the, um, the last example where the client can request the PR group and Radiant One will flatten the nested group and return the members in that single search response to the client. If you look at the member attribute of a group entry, it's a multi-valued collection of the distinguished names of the direct members of the group. Now, if you look at the member of attribute of a user entry, it's a multi-valued collection of DNs of the groups the user is a member of. So this referential integrity is computed and maintained by the server. Sometimes it's more efficient for applications to check a user's group membership by requesting the member of attribute in the user entry, um, as opposed to searching in the member attribute of the group entry. Different directory vendors use a different attribute name, to store this membership at the user entry level. Uh, Active Directory uses member of. Um, Oracle Directory, the former Sun Directory, uh, uses is member of. IBM uses IBM all groups. So depending on the vendor, this will vary. So Radiant One has the ability to calculate the user's membership and return it to applications in the attribute that they expect in whatever attribute name they expect. In the example shown here, um, users and groups are from one Active Directory backend. Uh, in reality, users and their corresponding groups could come from many directory backends, making this computation performed by Radiant One even more powerful. These next couple slides uh, describe the virtualization process at a high level. So we have each data silo shown at the top, databases, applications, uh, directories, stores information in their own particular format, obviously, and you would access it using a certain protocol. It might be LDAP, it might be SQL through JDBC, it might be a RESTful web service call. The capability to extract the metadata, shown in the local model here in the, in the next layer down, so extracting that metadata from each source and creating the common object model, that's one of the key capabilities of the Federated Identity Service. This is also the first step, and it's the basis for performing the services offered by Radiant One. So the object and attribute mapping, the correlation, uh, the distributed join functionality, auto-generated groups, the view design, it all stems from first extracting the metadata, understanding the local data models, and then coming up with um, the, the global model by linking any overlapping identities. When users are located in more than one source, the identity hub that I mentioned um, maintains the links to all those local identifiers. So with those links, those are the critical pieces for things like credentials checking. So whenever we need to validate a user's password against one of the local sources, 
Um, it's also required for building a global profile, knowing which attributes to join and what data source to pull them from. Once you have the links across the different data sources and the, um, the unique list, then you can start to decide what to do about the group's management. You can also project many different views of the identities in the group. So shown at the bottom here is just representing um, at a high level different hierarchies, for example. So with these different views, you can serve many different applications and each one gets a view that's been catered to their specific needs. Also accessible via their desired protocol, which it might be LDAP, it might be SCIM, it might be REST. So you can accommodate more than just the classic LDAP applications with the views that you're designing in Radiant 1. So the layer that you're putting in place here, you can reuse it. Um, obviously, reusing anything helps maximize your return on your investment. It is these final, the final virtual views also that you can persist in the cache, the local storage, known as our HDAP store. And this just ensures that the overhead involved that's needed when we're doing the distributed joins and the computations isn't going to hinder your performance. We want to make sure that that information is delivered at the speeds that are expected when an application is querying a directory. Okay, uh, just a quick introduction to the, the um, complete suite of Radiant 1 components, just so you can get a global view of where they fit in with the functionality that I've talked about today. So first and foremost, the, the federated identity, um, it's the core of the architecture, and it provides an abstraction layer for all identity sources. Um, this is the component that I've been talking about today, and it what's, it's what provides that single logical point of access to locate identities and the profiles, the attributes, and the groups. We refer to that central uh, access point, as, I, as I've talked about, um, and the storage as the identity hub. And by implementing an identity hub like this, you gain a lot of flexibility and scalability because each application, now depicted at, at the top layer there, um, and each data source, depicted on the data sources level, it becomes a spoke off of this hub. So taking on a new initiative that might call for a new application, or if you have a merger and acquisition and now you have a whole new user population, you can integrate these new sets of identities and groups with your applications now very quickly, in a matter of hours oftentimes, instead of something that might have taken you months to do in the past. Delegating these integration tasks to a layer that's specialized for this purpose makes a lot more sense than having to rely on the application itself to be smart enough and flexible enough to deal with each new data source, the unique way it stores the identity information and how, you know, how it manages groups within that particular source. Radiant Logic also offers um, an add-on security token service component. Um, this component can generate SAML tokens for federated access and single sign-on. This layer is uh, named Cloud Federation Service, and it's shown as uh, CFS in this diagram. So CFS, in, in conjunction with the FID, offer a complete federated identity service, um, a complete identity provider that you can deploy on-premises. Uh, just to note here that you don't have to use this component for uh, federated access. Um, other federation servers like ADFS, for example, can leverage the FID piece as well. Or if you have your own federation vendor in-house, um, all the ones that I've worked with so far can support um, accessing an LDAP directory to identify users, to retrieve attributes, to augment claims, things of that nature, and they would just point to the FID layer as a classic LDAP directory. Um, lastly, <clears throat> the identity correlation and synchronization components, so the ICS part of the diagram. It's for advanced identity correlation tasks where um, possibly you might have multiple matching rules. It may not just be a simple match to correlate an identity. You may have to have some cascading rules, something more complex. You can use the ICS for um, purposes like that. It also includes 
bi-directional connectors that uh, detect changes and synchronize those changes to many different targets. Um, and then it also has a rule engine as well. So if you want to have very specific conditions and actions to synchronize information, um, you can do that within that component. Lastly, I want to give you uh, some idea how Radiant One is deployed. So a cluster architecture is used for uh, scalability, scalability and high availability. Within a cluster, a minimum of three core nodes are required, and a load balancer directs the client traffic across the cluster nodes. Um, of the three core nodes, there will always be a leader node, and the rest are noted as follower nodes. The leader and the follower status of each node is handled by Zookeeper, which is a cluster configuration manager. It manages the configuration of the, the files for consistency across all cluster nodes. Um, if the leader process, the leader FID process were to fail, one of the other follower nodes would automatically be elected and it would ensure the integrity of the cluster. The consistency of um, the HDAP image, so when you deploy that cache image in our HDAP store, that image across all the cluster nodes is handled with a block replication. So you see that arrow there between the nodes as indicated as block replication. That is for um, managing the, the HDAP image. This replication flows from the leader node to all the follower or follower only nodes. So just as shown in the diagram here. So all changes to the HDAP data that are done, they'll all be done on the leader node and then replicated out to the follower and follower only nodes. A follower only nodes, they're a special kind of node. They never would become a leader. Uh, they're a lightweight node. They don't require the additional functions and features of a leader or follower node. Um, you can add these types of nodes to the cluster um, to handle additional client loads to make it so if you want to scale out and add more nodes quickly, you can add follower only nodes. They're lighter and easier to deploy and they improve your throughput. Another advantage of uh, deploying a cluster is the ease and the speed at which you can scale. So additional nodes, you can add them extremely fast. Once you install the Radiant One software on, a, on a, a new machine and you indicate, okay, I want it to join an existing cluster, the current configuration files, the current HDAP data store information, all of that is applied to that new node quickly. And it can become operational with that, within a matter of minutes. So it's very easy to scale out adding additional nodes to your cluster. All right, uh, just a quick summary and some important takeaways, and then I'll move on to answer some of your questions. Bottom line, large organizations have many heterogeneous data sources, often a mix of Active Directory domains, LDAP directories, databases where they have identity and group information. Across these data sources, there's often overlapping user accounts and groups um, that you need to rationalize either prior to deploying or evolving your access management or federation architecture. Uh, on the data management side, bringing in new data sources or trying to evolve static groups manually every time a person's job description or function changes can start to become cumbersome. Oftentimes, even the sheer number of groups that need to be created and managed can be mind-boggling. We've got customers who have more groups than they have users. So these um, evolve and grow over time. On the application side, trying to maintain connections to multiple user stores and identity mappings doesn't make sense either. With Radiant One, you can build a reference image that provides the global list, the global list of users, the complete profile, the rationalized view of groups, and you also benefit from the ability of auto-generating auto the groups like I talked about today allowing users to be dynamically assigned to groups based on attributes of their profile. This vastly simplifies the management of groups because administrators no longer need to manually move the members when you know a variety of a business role changes, for example. Uh, in Radiant One, you benefit from an entire set of wizards and GUI tools that are going to help you. They're specialized in aggregating and correlating accounts, 
um, defining your profile attributes, which attributes to pull from which data sources. Uh, also, what do you want to do about groups? Uh, Auto-generating new groups, flattening nested groups, uh, evaluating LDAP dynamic groups. So you have wizards and tools in your, in your kit that help you do that. Um, also, all of this identity and group integration comes with a complete persistent cache mechanism. So you want to make sure that that information can be delivered at guaranteed speeds. So at the end, at the end result here, you've got a complete list of your users and your groups that then you can use for authentication and enforcing um, policies. With this layer in place too, like I talked about, um, it's a flexible layer that's going to help you simplify your IAM deployments, extend the reach of uh, new user populations quickly, um, evolve the usage of your static groups to a more ABAC-like model, basing your groups on attributes of the user's profile. And then it also allows you to easily adjust to new requirements in the future. Okay, so with that said, I will go ahead and read through some of your questions. Oh, let's see. How are complex correlation rules defined in Radiant 1? Um, well, as I mentioned, we have configuration wizards that provide you with a, a set of functions that you can use to define the computations on the existing attributes. So I mentioned part of the process was being able to connect to the variety of different data sources, extract the metadata, understand how an identity is um, stored in each of these different systems. So with that information now, it's like you have your map um, of being able to determine, okay, what information in source A can be used if I apply some rules on it to match a common identity in source B. So with that metadata information and the functions that we offer for you to be able to um, compute and calculate common uh, values for the different system, for the different users, so basically, these, you can use these components in the correlation rules to establish those reference links that I talked about. And then um, that will be the basis for not only linking the identity, but also maintaining that reference link back to the original source, which is key for the credential checking and also being able to dynamically join and pull those profiles across those distributed systems. Uh, as I mentioned, if you want to do complex correlation rules, the ICS component offered in our suite is what you would use for that. One additional thing too in ICS I didn't mention, um, there's a data analysis utility. So sometimes what happens at our customers is they think they have their correlation rules pretty accurate and they think they're gonna have a good match on these rules and it turns out their data is not so clean. So their rules that should have been matches aren't because they're data, they're data quality problems. Uh, the data analysis tool can be run prior to setting up your uh, correlation rules, so you can get a report on your um, data sources, the attributes in each data source. It'll give you things like um, number of total entries in the source, number of total entries now per attribute, how many of those entries have you know, an email address, how many of these entries have an, uh, an employee ID. So you can start to see um, if the quality of the attributes that you're going to base your rules on is good or not. Um, at the end of the process, there may be some data cleaning that has, to, that has to happen before you can actually use the correlation rules that are built into our, our functions to match your identity. But at least the data analysis tool gives you a glimpse into your data before you start setting up your correlation rules. Next question, um, if I'm already using an LDAP expression to assign users to policies, what benefit would I gain by using Radiant 1? Um, well, if all required attributes are from a single data source and you don't have any performance issues for your application to evaluate the policies with this, then you might not need Radiant 1. Um, however, if the attributes are required that you need are sitting in multiple data sources, and the overlapping accounts, especially in scenarios where you don't have a common identifier, then your data integration challenge just got a lot more complex. So it's these types of scenarios where you would need Radiant 1. Um, 
After all, the reason you would use an LDAP expression anyway for your policy to begin with is because it, it provides you some additional functionality. It provides you some flexibility over assigning users to your policy over using a static group. Um, but there are limitations with this approach because again, applications aren't in the business of identity integration, right? So if you're in a situation where you have multiple sources of identities and groups, performing that needed integration task at a layer that's specialized for that makes more sense. So I would just say, again, if it's, if it's a simple scenario and you have all your attributes in one store, you probably don't need Radiant 1. If you have a scenario where you have multiple data sources with distributed attributes, common overlapping accounts, then in situations like that, it makes more sense to rely on something like Radiant 1 than trying to make the application um, handle more complex challenges like that. If I want to decommission my legacy LDAP directory, can the legacy data be stored in Radiant 1? Does it have local schema and storage? Uh, yes, so the HDAP storage that I talked about for storing a cache image, um, it's also a full, full local storage. You can use it for anything that you want to. It can store any legacy LDAP data directly in it um, as well. So it's not just for a cache store. Um, it can also be used as uh, a new storage to, if you wanted to migrate away from a legacy LDAP directory and you have some integration challenges like I've talked about today, you can leverage both our, our virtualization integration layer and our HDAP store. So you have um, the scenario where you can, you can integrate and deal with those challenges and then also have the actual storage replacement for your legacy LDAP as well. Um, in terms of the schema, it, it does. We have um, an LDAP schema that we can project to applications that need that information. Um, but also it's an extensible schema. So it's more like a, a NoSQL type of storage where an application can write an attribute that doesn't have to be predefined in our schema. So that gives a lot of flexibility for applications that aren't just LDAP specific. For writes during authentication, do those writes go to endpoints or are they maintained in FID? Um, for writes during authentication, you have your choice. If the attribute that is being written to is coming from one of the backends that is, that is being virtualized by Radiant 1, we can delegate that write request back to the backend. Um, if that's not desirable, if you don't have any backends that can have the schema information to uh, store that, that information, you can write that information locally into our FID store. So not only, because um, there's actually, there's two parts to that, right? There's being able to authenticate the user, validate their credentials, and then afterward, I'm assuming this question um, is about uh, writing, I don't know, maybe like a last login, for example, which would happen after the, the authentication. So the delegation of the credentials can still go back to the authoritative backend, and the write operation, the subsequent write operation can be handled locally by our store if needed. So it's kind of up to you, both options are available. Uh, last question here, uh, yeah. Does the data cached in FID become stale if changes are made on the backend? Would an aggregation need to run to pick up any changes or can the changes be pushed? Um, if you are deploying a cache in Radiant 1, um, the, and if something changes on the back end, we have a cache refresh component that's built into our product that can detect those changes. Now the change detection types will vary. So if it's um, a backend directory, let's say, um, that offers a change log or a persistent search mechanism that we can leverage for uh, detecting changes, you can use that. Um, if it's a, a database backend, we have um, the, the cache refresh connector can leverage uh, triggers that are on the database table that can uh, basically notify or log the, the change for our connector to pick the change up from. Um, so again, this will have, you'll have various options here as well, but um, bottom line is, yeah, if you're, if you're caching, 
the information, you want to make sure that if that information changes, it gets refreshed in the cache image as well. So you can, and you also have a, a periodic refresh option as well. So it doesn't have to be this real time change detection mechanism. It's one, it's one option. Um, but if you know your data doesn't change that frequently, maybe once or twice a day, you can schedule a cache refresh for those periods during the day as well. All right, um, I think that's all I have time for today, question-wise. Uh, I want to thank you everyone for attending today, and um, I think it was already mentioned, but we will be emailing out a copy of the webinar, and if you have any follow-up questions afterwards, you can uh, get those into us and we'll get them answered for you. Thanks a lot, everyone.